It's a good win. There's a lot of people. It's like Woodstock, except everybody's got their clothes on. But eat a damn snack. You're like my wife when you get in space. You just get lost. Short steps are better than long steps. That's the only time in your life you're going to hit short is better than long. Welcome everyone back to 614 Headsets, the show where we say football is unconditional love. We couldn't agree more. This podcast is based out of Central Ohio. That's why we're the 614 Headsets crew. A little bit different of an episode tonight. We had a few bill of conflicts between Ryan and Donovan. And so tonight it's going to be me leading the show with a couple special guests. Uh, coach Brad Birchfield, the head coach of Bishop Hartley High School, and my dear friend and colleague Marat Holiday, the defensive coordinator of Gahanna, is going to help me dive into a, a special episode I think you guys are going to like content-wise. I hope everybody enjoys what we're doing. Please make sure you subscribe to the show. Hop on. Subscribe on any of your favorite platforms. Give us a rating. Give us a retweet. Send it to your friends. As coaches, we're competitive. We want to keep doing the best we very can. We want to keep growing this thing and celebrate Central Ohio football as well as just football in general. Today, we're going to get into episode 45, Strong Roots. We're going to dive into developing a player-centered program and player development. So this is going to be more of a culture pod, and I hope you enjoy it. As we get started, I want to make sure we feature Fundraising University. We're very proud to be sponsored and powered by Fundraising University Ohio. They offer a variety of fundraising efforts that helps football teams run profitable, effective, and fast-paced fundraisers designed to raise the most money in the shortest amount of time to reach their fundraising goals. Fundraising University Ohio is locally owned, operated, and with their six-step blitz system will help your team maximize profits. As the current coach himself, Brent Maxwell with Fundraising University will sit down and help you pick, plan, and strategize your next fundraiser. If you're interested in us running a fundraiser for you, contact Brent Maxwell at bmaxwell at fundraising, the letter U dot net, or 740-501-8946. This is a fantastic time as Brent is currently scheduling teams to outline the summer and help you dominate the day in your fundraising goals. A new episode we came out with, or I should say new segment, is Start of the Pot. It's a working title. And we wanted to do something in season two and moving beyond about a quote, a word, or a lesson, or a challenge for listeners. Coach Ryan Sayers came up with this. He took it from the Inky Johnson podcast, a phenomenal idea just to develop and do more with what we're doing. Uh, and today I have the honor of doing it since I'm the only one. Thanks, Ryan and Donovan. But mine's more of a challenge. And so I'm going to challenge any listener today to, uh, to my thing for this week. All right. My challenge was very uh, much sponsored by Mother's Day. We live in a very fast paced world. It's a go attack the day, all gas type of a life. Sometimes that takes your focus away from the little things. And so my challenge is sometime in the next week as a listener, find the opportunity, the moment to enjoy something small. For me, it was holding my son uh, for a nap. We were at my mother-in-law's house and, and getting to hold my son for a nap for about two hours in a rocking chair in a room by myself. And it, it really dawned on me that uh, I don't get to do that as much as I did with my, my daughter. That was something, those opportunities came a lot the fast paced life of doing this now and being a coordinator and all, all the different things and having two kids, it, it dawned on me like, man, I don't know the last time I, I had a moment to soak holding in my son and see him napping in your arms and smiling, whatever you could find as a little moment, I'm going to challenge you to do that. And, and that two hour moment for me in a side room, rocking away, life slowed down. It's something I was able to capture and hold on to hopefully for a long time. I took a picture of it and just tried to mentally be like, Hey, remember this as they get older. So today's thought of the pod, I, my challenge, guys, is try to find a small moment, whatever it may be, to capture and, and slow life down and, and grab something that's probably really more important than whatever might be the, the fast-paced thing going on, okay? And so episode 45, Strong Roots, a little bit more of a culture pod. Enjoy it. Thank you for uh, joining us and, and being a part of uh, this lifestyle we're all about. Enjoy the show. <laughs> We got a great night tonight. I'm excited. This is a completely different show. This is the first time we've had a few repeat different co-hosts on today. We've got Brad Birchfield, the head coach of Bishop Hartley High School. 
Marad Holiday, my closest friend, defensive coordinator at Gehanna Lincoln High School. And then obviously tonight's guest of honor, Coach Bartholomew, the head coach of Olentangy High School. How are we doing today, guys? Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, this is going to be good. I can't wait. we got two great guests to be on this type of a episode, episode 45, Strong Roots, okay? Uh, coach Bartholomew, just so everybody gets to know him, uh, heading into the start of his third season at Olentangy High School, uh, 2023 finish of 11 and 2. Uh, exciting year coming up because I know he has a lot of pieces coming back in a lot of different ways, especially with Jackson Wiley. Prior to that was that Bloom Carroll between 2014 and 2021. Overall record of 67-25, back-to-back state semifinal teams, four straight conference championships last four years, previous stops at Logan Elm, Galea Academy, Huntington. I, I tried to do my best research about you, Coach, and you can fill in any gaps as well. Your father's the head coach at Chillicothe. We had an opportunity to both be at a clinic, or all three of us be at a clinic, which was fun this offseason at the West Jeff Clinic. So, Coach, thanks for coming on. I'm excited to get you on. It's our first time having somebody on from Olin Tangy. We won't talk about the other and told him she said no, <laughs> but uh, we'll leave that to be that. So, Coach, thank you. Just take a moment. If I fill in any gaps for us, what's led you to this journey that you've gotten to? Yeah, um, you mentioned the biggest piece of my journey is my father being a high school head football coach. From the time I was born, um, he was coaching high school sports. He actually got into coaching baseball was where I started and then slowly transitioned to becoming a football coach. I grew up on the, the gridiron, man. I was his water boy from the time I was able to pick up a six pack and I was at every two a day. I was at every coach's meeting. I, I remember traveling m hundreds of miles in his truck to, to trade films because back then you had to trade VHSs. And then when I became a little smarter in the technology world, I was the one creating the DVDs and making sure those things got copied and uh, played underneath my dad. Uh, probably one of the coolest Stories that me and my father have is we're one of the few people that where I played under my dad and then I came back and coached under my dad. And then I actually coached against my dad. I've been able to hit all those different avenues. And then finally to finish it off, my dad came and coached under me. Very unique situation with us. We're truly a football family through and through. I got an opportunity to play quarterback at a high Dominican and Capital University. End up coaching with my dad my senior year of college and just jumped into the realm of football at that point in time. We got to ask, did you beat your dad? <laughs> Unfortunately, I did not. It was my first <laughs> Everybody year. wants to know, man. Yeah. Yeah, I was great. waiting. I was waiting. You know, I had to ask. I didn't know yeah, the answer yeah. to it. So I knew people out there. That's the first thing in my mind was going yeah. to. So dad got you. Does dad ever bring it back up? No. Well, yes. Yeah, so it's actually a running joke in the family a little bit. He refuses to play me ever again. I keep telling him I got opening spots in 2024, yeah. 2025. Like, come on up. And he's like, I'll, I'll take that one and oh to the grave. Yeah. He says, um, I'm one and oh, cut that turkey, boy. That's <laughs> great. Exactly. Uh, 100%, man. <laughs> that's great, man. And as we're going to get into it, as always, everybody knows we're going to get into the pick six segment, right? We're going to rapid fire six questions at coach so we can all get to know him a little bit more. And as we get started, just so everybody knows, pick six segment is uh, powered by story rivals. Okay. Championships, friendships, and life lessons are among the most meaningful parts of athletic competition. We are passionate about preserving them by offering the most unique highlight experience available. Storied Rivals delivers your team's content with services designed to change the way you experience these unforgettable moments now and for a lifetime. Storied Rivals now offers a complete team apparel and player shop customizable to your program. Contact us by email at info at storyrivals.com. To find out more and if any of you are already using story rivals for your highlight stuff because we know they're one of their premier people in the area you would be amazed at how you can package that into a player shop and what it could do for you so reach out to them okay round robin okay guys i know we got some new hosts on here we're gonna go one two three and, and go through this almost start <laughs> us okay you might say it's your dad and that's okay if you want to answer this but who has been the greatest influence in your life, Coach, that shaped you as a coach at this point? I'm going to go a little bit off the, the record and say my mom. My, my dad taught me a ton about football. I mean, he taught me the X's and O's. He taught me how to be a head coach. He was grooming me from the beginning to, to know how to handle parents, organize practices, all, all those different things. But I get a different route from my dad as the type of coach I am. And I'm a little bit more of your empathetic, your player-driven um, kind of your heartfelt kind of guy. And I 100% I get that from my mom. My mom's one of the most soft-hearted individuals in the world. She truly cares. I don't know how many kids 
while, while I was growing up that would stay over the weekend or, or she would invite over for a meal or, or pack an extra lunch and make me or my sisters take it to school for him. And it just really taught me that people are people. And my dad was a football coach and he would help bring home kids. And I don't, we paid countless of pay to play fees and things like that, but it was always driven from my mom, Mrs. B, who she was known at. And um, so I just think she really drove me to be the type of coach I really am. That's just different from my father. I like it. Mo, you're up next. I'm most so excited for this segment. He put more <laughs> more down than two. So we might have an overtime today, yeah. which is great. We've never had an overtime on the pick six. Let's do it. <laughs> I do have a couple. The first one is, uh, do you have a hobby that would surprise people if you told them? Brad actually knows this. I, I love to read. I really do. I know people say, oh, I'll read to get better. Brad's a leadership guy. We pass some books back and forth, but I, I'm a huge fantasy nerd. I am probably reading a fantasy book once a week, okay. just all over the place. Harry Potter is probably my biggest nerd phase. I've read each one of those books probably 15 different times. I'll go back and reread them. But like I, on my phone right now, I could pull up four or five different fantasy books. I also listen to them when I'm out jogging and I'm working out. Um, so that's probably the biggest hobby I have, honestly, is I read a lot. That's awesome. Therapeutic. Yes. Yes. Wade, you've won a lot of games and I just can't imagine those coaches you beat sitting across the sideline saying, we just got beat by a freaking guy who reads Harry Potter. That's the most <laughs> unbelievable thing I've, I think I could imagine hearing. Uh, touching on that line, you've coached all over the state. You've coached, coached in a couple different kind of regions, and uh, you've coached against some great people. Who's an underrated coach that maybe people don't talk about that you've coached against? One of the best coaches you've coached against that maybe people don't talk as much about? Oh, man. I'm going to – I'm gonna. yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm trying to, I'm racking. I, I can see his name. I can see him. I don't want to butcher his name, but I got to give Kyle Gallion. I believe is how you say it down in Piketon. He's been there for a long time. He followed his dad's footsteps. He does an unbelievable job down there at Piketon. If you guys know Pike County, it's a tough place to live. It's a tough place to, to go to football program. And he's had some really good football teams down in the SVC and, and get an opportunity to make the playoffs. But Tyler Gullion, I definitely would say is an underrated guy that if any point in time he wanted to pull the trigger to come bigger and come towards central Ohio, somebody's definitely got to give him a shot. And that's a cool thing. There's people all over the state that people don't, they don't have a huge social media presence or whatever, but they're unbelievable coaches and it's cool to get to coach against those guys. Absolutely. So coach, reach out to me. Let's be on Buckeye ball, baby. We're trying to feature all the great coaches. Brad, I'm still waiting for your Buckeye ball page, baby. All right. So remember that. All right. Even you, Wade, I even messed up. And Murad, all three of you, just waiting. Just, just so y'all know. It's busy recruiting. I get it. Hey, just want to feature great coaches. That's what yeah. we were trying to do. Grow this great thing. And I think everybody needs to know how great the football is around this area. I really yeah. think it's special. I think when you coach in other places and you come here, you see how around this area, how great it is. And I think other people need to see that and know that as well. Coach, I'm going to come at you a little bit. Coach Sayers can't be with us tonight. He had a conflict, and one of the first things he mentioned was the hair, okay? <laughs> and so that hair says you've been to a lot of festivals in your day. I, I, maybe. I don't know. And so what's maybe the best concert you've ever been to in your life? Um, <clears throat> so it's actually the complete opposite. I, I'm really not. I'm really not that kind of person at all. I'm really not a concert goer. I'm really not a partier. But – I can say my favorite concert was my first ever concert. My friend drug me to it. I had no clue what it was, but it was Slipknot. Slipknot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I love every second of it, man. Those dudes were crazy, wore the mask. They were throwing stuff off the stage. They were throwing each okay. other off the stage. It was crazy. It was intense. The the second part of that is, do you have a bucket list? If there's somebody you could ever go back and listen to. Who Michael Jackson. Be? Okay. Hundred percent. Right. Yeah, all the right, greatest cool. of all time, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I would see Michael Jackson. I would spend thousands and thousands of dollars to go watch Michael Jackson. All right. The way concerts are now, you spend thousands. Of dollars. <laughs> yeah, you would if he was around. <laughs> Those tickets are ridiculous now. Yeah, so. for sure. <laughs> the Those guys in the OCC, there, I, I can just see them every Sunday sitting around saying. This guy goes to Slipknot concerts and reads Harry Potter. It just keeps getting added to hey, it. Man, dude, <laughs> he's, man. he's a man of mystery right now. Absolutely. I might have to change this from wrong roots to man of mystery. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I'm, listen, I'm scooching up right now because I'm just waiting yeah. to see what keeps coming. All right, Mo, what you got? That's, that's awesome, man. How do you stay up to date with the latest trends and developments in football? 
honestly, just talking to bodies, talking to guys, having the opportunity to be under my dad. I have a huge network of coaches. Like Brad said, I coached in Southern Ohio football all the way down to the river. I coached in Chillicothe, Ohio. I was at Logan Elm, which is Pickway County. I got an opportunity to be in Bloom, which was over there in Fair, uh, Fairfield County. And then all of a sudden up here. So I have a huge network of coaches. So I, I just like to reach out to them. This job is really, yeah, as the little one trying to sneak <laughs> by. But uh, just that type of stuff. I, I Like I said, reading, because reading is such a huge hobby of mine, I, I read a lot of not only fantasy, but I do pick up a lot of leadership books, a lot of development, mental health, just all kinds of different stuff that I know might lead to just some little tiny tidbit of information that would help me be different or better for our kids. And I, I think Honestly, just to be a, be a great head coach, you, you got to be willing to, to reach out and just ask people questions, no matter who they are or what they've done in their lives. So I think that's a big piece for me is I, I developed just by reaching out to people I know. And, and like I said earlier, I know me and Brad, we, we text, a, we have a lot of cool texts, just simply reach out, just ask a, a, just an open question and just see what his thoughts are and what my thoughts are. Absolutely. The networking piece I, I enjoy and I still enjoy and I know that technology comes around and everybody's on different things, but I like just going and just having a conversation with someone. You get a little bit more nuggets if you're just sitting there having a conversation with someone. So you get to read, you get to read their body language and, mm -hmm. and are they really telling you the truth or are they just mm -hmm. giving you some cookie cutter bland answer that they think's the right one, right? Like you can really dive deep into it. So I, yeah, I, I really love those one-on-one -on -one just personal conversations to see what people think. And as Coach Stout said earlier, our game is changing in Ohio right now rapidly. And so just to get a feel for what is everybody doing, what does everybody believe in, I think it's very important. Absolutely. I do think we're at a great time. I think a lot of people sometimes bash technology and make complaints about it, but the ability that you have to network and talk to other coaches and see great content about culture and leadership and X's and O's, any one of those pulls up our X or Twitter or whatever you call it nowadays, it's just chock full of great information. Oh, and yeah. if you could funnel that in the right categories and decipher, that's for me, that's not for me, reach out to different people. I think we really are coaching in a really great opportunity in terms of an access to information. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do with that, what you using it the right way, that's other things, but there's never been another time in our game where you can see so much X's and O's, so much about culture, so much about leadership, the ability to reach out. Hey, can I pick your brain about something? We had Coach Conduti on here and just being able to have him on the podcast and then afterwards talk. Hey, man, let's talk a little bit more about that. Him send you film and do some things like that's what's great about the time and the, the generation we're coaching in. Right? Brad, I'm waiting, man. I don't know how you're going to outdo the last yeah, question, but I'm waiting. Man. I got stuff on my mind, obviously. <laughs> I want to know from him. He is, he, you made a significant jump from maybe a smaller enrollment school to a larger enrollment school. And I think this is a great question for many coaches is what was it that I, I, people will say, what were you not prepared for? What did you learn? And I don't know if that's an accurate thing, but you could take it however you got. What surprised you? What did you, what helped prepare you for a jump and what didn't? We often get into discussions with coaches that this guy coached at that small school. He could never do it at that big school and having played everybody at all divisions i think that's hogwash the really good ones are really good ones and the ones that aren't take that however you want but what was the jump like and what did you learn and what would you do yeah so i decided to make the jump because i've been around small high school football my whole life we talked about that my dad never coached anywhere bigger than division three school and so i wanted to make the jump just to see what it was and, and to be honest with you i was super intimidated division one it was always my dream we went up to the state championship games every year watched all the games and that friday night or that saturday when d1 was uh, that was my super bowl as a kid i've been at those things for 25 years now and honestly i was intimidated it was like man this huge role of d1 and d1 kids and uh, probably about three days into being in the weight room after i got the job i just looked at myself and i just said these are kids they're 15 to 18 year old kids. They, they really are no different at Bloom Carroll or at Huntington or at Gallia where I was like, they're still just kids. And it really gave me a chance just to calm down and, and relax and, and see it that way. But I'll be, like I said, I was intimidated by man, all these just unbelievable athletes and you got this D1 offer and that D1 offer, but ultimately it comes down to it. They're just kids. But I think you have to be super organized, honestly, Brad. And I think to be a head coach or be a very efficient head coach, you have to be organized and all kinds of things, not just the X's and O's, not just the practice planning, but how are you going to send emails? How are you going to get the data from the kids and the parents? 
how are you going to do helmet fitting? How are you going to do jersey pass out? All those different things. If you're very organized, it really is no different. It's just instead of doing it for 40 kids or 60 kids in your program, now you're doing it for 120 to 130, but that organization doesn't change and it just expands. And then finally, the last thing I think, and we all know this, but you got to get the right people around you on your coaching staff because you can't be as hands-on. Bloom, if I was missing, <clears throat> I could coach the running backs, quarterbacks, and wide receivers all at once. We could do a team period and I could have two coaches there. As long as I got a guy watching the O-line, I, I knew where all my receivers and running backs were going. And same thing defensively. As long as you got somebody to watch the back end, maybe you can watch the front end. You can't do that at, at this level because you go to get the wide receivers, quarterbacks, and running backs together. You could, you could have 50 kids. Um, and so I think just knowing that you got to get really good people around you that truly believe in what you're trying to build and believe in who you are and are willing to just go out there and do it and, and have trust and faith that they can do it. Because I have to give my defensive coordinator the defense. He has to be my associate head coach because there's 60 kids that I never see. I never, I don't know how they're practicing. I don't know what he's doing down there. And I just have to have that faith and I have to have a great guy around me. So if I had to give anybody advice, those would be the three biggest things is kids are kids. They're still 18 to 15. They still want to be loved. They still want to be cared for. They still want to be hyped up. They still want to be, have fun with, be super organized, however that can be. And then finally, just, you've got to find great people to be around you. I love it. Hey, yeah. Mo, I like your yeah. last question, man. So we're going to, we're going to allow the, the pick six to turn into the score seven. You know what I mean? I don't know what we're going to title it, but go ahead. get put, Throw that last one out. Okay. I'm a second-generation coach. My mother was a head track and volleyball coach at Marion Franklin in South High School for 35 years. You can touch on Rest early. in peace, Mo. Yes. All right. Yes. One love to you, yes. your family, and mom. That. I appreciate that. That was uh, Easter. Um, what is different growing up as a coach's son? For me, I just say for me, it was yeah. – I, I had a little chair around the curve of the track that I had to sit there the whole time. <laughs> On the volleyball, I had a certain place I had to sit. Half of the her players were babysitters for me. So what is different growing up as a coach's son? Um, I, I think you touched on it, the discipline, right? When you're a coach's son on Friday nights, you're not out behind the stands throwing the ball. You know what I'm saying? You're on the sidelines. You're, you've got a job to do. And, and until you can be that kid that's got the helmet and the shoulder pads on, like you, you have a role. And my role was to be the water boy or to run in the locker room when dad needed something. So Halftime, as long as I got the waters in, I was able to go play ball for that 10 minutes with my, my friends out back. But as soon as that five minute mark hit or I saw the team walk out of the dug or locker room, boom, I had to bolt, man. I had a job to do. I also think the biggest thing it taught me too, and I, we know how important this is, but that selflessness, as, as, a, as a player, like you just you learned that the team was so much bigger than yourself. I mean, probably like all of us, we had aspirations to play college football just like I did, but it was never about me. It was always about like, how can I win? How can I help my teammates win? And so I was that guy that just in all three sports, I wanted to be the person that passed the ball. I wanted to be the person that got rid of the ball and just go set a screen or go be the catcher and put your put your body on the line, blocking block a play. So I think those two things biggest, like just the discipline of knowing like sports were important and you had to be somewhere like you couldn't just be running off doing whatever you wanted. And I just think it always told me to put the team first. And so I just always had this super selfless mindset uh, because you know, I always saw my dad talk about this, how important that was. And it just drove me home. It just drove home. I percent agree. I had to let that one go in, man. I know that's important to you, special to you, Mo. And uh, yeah. that's a pick six segment. Or the score seven at this point, sponsored by Storied Rivals. Make sure you reach out to them. Let's get into this main topic with, uh, with Coach. All right, I love titles, man. And so episode 45 is Strong Roots. That's what we're calling it, right? <laughs> There's a lot of components that go into a successful program. And uh, ultimately, I talked with Coach. We talked about a month ago about setting up this show. We talked about you know, what's what are you passionate about? Right? And uh, the most important ingredient is the players. I think that's already become evident talking to Coach. And uh, the players are the, the backbone of a successful mm -hmm. program, right? And for it to thrive, you got to have a deep and strong foundation. And I remember this uh, this sermon series from Greg Ford at One Church, and he did something about your roots. Right? He kept having this symbolism of having a plant out there at church every day and talking about the roots and everything geared towards that. And I just thought that'd be a fantastic uh, title for Coach Wade today as he comes on. I, you know what? I'm glad Ryan, I'm glad Diamond can't be on. Mm -hmm. I love you guys, but you suck. 
and these two coaches, Brad, no, I'm kidding, Brad and Mo, uh, some of the best coaches I could think to have on as co-hosts for tonight. Brad has done a phenomenal job at Bishop Hartley when you talk about just doing it the right way and culture, about the players and everything. And I think he's going to be able to add some great things from his perspective. I get the opportunity to coach with Murad. We're, we're heading in our, our fifth year together. One of the best to do it. One of my best friends, a guy that gives all the pregame speeches and different things, but a true motivator, a true relationship guy. Today's going to be about player development and developing a, a player center program. So between Coach Wade, Coach Burfield, Coach uh, Murad, I appreciate you guys coming on. Like I couldn't think of a better crew to chop this episode up with than you guys. And I hope if you're listening, I hope you take something from this and it makes you and your team better in 2024, okay? And as we get started, I'll ask the first question, and, and guys, you can chime in and, and change it anywhere how you want it to go. Um, coach, I think as coaches, this is for Wade. I think a lot of us, we have a core belief, a motto, pillars, whatever it is. You've done this a couple times. What is your philosophy on culture? What are you building on Tangi? What are your pillars? What's your motto? What is it as we get started? Yeah. So talking about loving to read, I saw it's going to sound very familiar to a lot of people, but when Urban Meyer came out with the book above the line, I read that and then it jumped into the focus three stuff from Tim and Brian Kite. And so we build our, we have a culture playbook and I got a chance to put it together in 2017. And honestly, that's when the programs that we were a part of really started to take off, not just wins and losses, but just player development. So we buy into to three pillars and we ask our kids for three behaviors. So behaviors, Beliefs, behaviors, outcomes is what we talk to our kids a lot about. But selflessness, 100% is the number one for us. Being selfless, putting the team first, caring for all your teammates. I know old school, a lot of old school coaches are, you don't have to, you don't have to like them. You got to respect them. You got to play with them. That's not who we are in our program. Like you have to care for your teammates. You got to understand we, we do walk around the hallway with almost 1,800 kids in our building, 155 football players. You guys can care for each other. You guys can see a teammate and, 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 and struggling and go talk to him and go help him. The second one is relentless effort, which I 100% stole from Urban in that, that four to six A to B. We preach to our kids all the time, like just effort is everything. We slap fierce competitiveness under relentless effort because I tell the kids, I've never seen somebody that I call a competitor not give me great effort. That's really what we want. No matter the situation, no matter when you're down, we just want you to, we want you to compete. But competing to me is just giving all the effort you possibly can. And so that we tag that under relentless effort. And then finally, the third is accountability. I'm a huge growth mindset guy. So if you're looking for a great book, Carol Dweck's book on growth mindset is an unbelievable read. It talks about two different versions of fixed mindset and growth mindset and kind of the, the meaning and the science behind it. But I'm a huge growth mindset guy. So we talk about growing from your failures. We ask our kids to fail. We ask our kids to go out there and do everything they can and, and find a way. Where is their peak? Where is that that moment that we can help them go beyond. But if they never help us get to that, that moment by giving us everything they got and learning, winning, being okay to fail, we're not getting there. And then Extreme Ownership, that's another great book. If you haven't read it, it's an unbelievable book there. It talks a lot about the military style of extreme ownership. So I stole that. So we talked to our kids about everything you have a part in. Um, the quarterback throws an interception. The, it's not just the quarterback's fault. It's you know, where the wide receiver at was the offensive lineman. So we don't blame anybody. And then finally on that one, we just, we talk about holding our teammates to the standard and holding yourself to the standard in all walks of life. So th those are the three huge pillars of who we are. And ever since we developed that as a staff at Bloom, I've just, I've hung on to it because I think it, it simplifies what we ask our kids to do. And so each week we're not coming with a new word. We're not coming with perseverance. We're not coming with work ethic. We're not coming with character. Every single day they hear that same message and I tell our kids all the time, if you're selfless, you're hardworking and you're accountable, there's a lot of other characteristics that are going to build within you as a person by being those three things at a very high level. So we've really stuck to those. Probably the fourth one, if I threw it out there, it's not really a pillar, but no BCD, which once again, I stole from Tim and Brian Kite, no blaming, no complaining and no defending. We don't let our kids do any of that. And that even includes the music. I'm 100% in charge of the music and practice. And literally uh, Celine Dion could pop on at any point in time. And they're not allowed to whine about it. They're not allowed to complain about it. It's a little bit of a mental test uh, for them, but we're really big on that. And then finally, I would say probably one of the biggest things we do a great job as our staff is we talk to our kids about bottom, top down, bottom up culture. 
to where if I'm not doing cultural based things, then any kid in our program is allowed to call me out. Any kid at any point in time is allowed to tell me, coach, that's not who we are. And same thing. So my coaches have to buy into who we are in the fact that if there's a sophomore that sees one of my coaches not giving great effort, he is allowed to go tell that coach to get his stuff together. And they have to be able to swallow that pill and swallow that ego, because if you're truly going to build a culture to where the expectations are where they are, then then you have to be able to hold yourself to that same standard. And you got to be able to be evaluated by anybody within the culture. Wade, do you see any challenges in in such an affluent community of teaching some of these old school values of selflessness? I have not so far, honestly, Brad. I mean, that's great. That's when I talk to everybody. It's been awesome. I would say it has a lot to do with the way that we handle that personal goal setting. We have a lot of kids that want to play big time football. And a lot of kids, you know how that works. They got to get to camps in June. They got to have their own speed trainer. They got to have their own trainer. They got to lift in, in differently. And I think the way that we go about handling that and those individual kids helps build that selflessness because they know that, yes, we're team oriented and gold, but we're also here to try to help you achieve your own personal goals in a way. I think that's awesome. That's awesome. I got part of that is about your culture. And then the other thing we want to talk about is developing a, a player centered program. And then maybe we'll go off into wherever the wind takes us. But you talked about one of the things that you said you pride yourself on or you're passionate about is developing a program that's player centered. Right. And that's what we talked about with strong roots. Talk to us. Like, what are some of those strategies? What are they? Let's dive into a few of them. You talked about your pillars of your culture. How do you make it then a, a player centered program? Yeah. So the, the one thing that we do is we put a leadership council together. And when I was at Bloom, we started it by, <clears throat> we had the kids all vote for kind of like captains, but we centered it more around leadership and gave them the standards of what we're looking for. It wasn't the best player. It wasn't this. It was is the best leaders, right? And we gave them that definition of leadership. And so we started there with five guys, slowly built it to where I ended up incorporating all of our seniors because our senior groups were just awesome. And there was no reason to leave any one of them out. If I could have 25 un- unbelievable leaders on the field. Why not? Why not train them? Why not develop them? Why not let them do it? When I got up here, I obviously can't do that. We have way too many bodies. So we put a leadership council together last year. And this is not to me, a leadership council to me is not teaching these kids about leadership. A leadership council to me is a council, right? It's a group of people that you trust that they know what they're doing that you can go to and, and get ideas from, or just let them help you design things. So Every January from here on out, just like I did this past January and the January before, I sit down with that leadership council and we talk about how are we structuring the weight room? What what kind of lifts do they want to get to? How long do they want to lift? What are the things they want to get into? I talk about our calendar from January all the way through, we hope December, right? And that's what we're all, the main goal is to get there. When do we want to practice? How long do we want to practice? What type of practice do we want on this? Hey guys, I want to make sure we have this many off days during the season. And when I say off days, I legitimate off days. Like they come to me and say, Hey, we want a Wednesday off. Then we take a Wednesday off and it doesn't matter what week it is. And so we, we look at that whole schedule and I truly give them the freedom to give me their voice. And we put it all together in that way. So they feel that. And so that leadership council is really a, truly a council for me. And we go through everything. They get to decide the spirit packs. They get to decide if we get new jerseys, they get to decide if what color our helmets are, all those cool things that kids really want to know. But then they also dive into what are the rules for us this year? Here's our rules last year. What are our rules? What are our goals this year? Here's our goals, just like probably everybody else does. But that's truly the player centered part of it. And obviously, then the leadership side, like then you can challenge those kids to go out and be the leaders of your program because they have a voice and they're they're a little bit more invested. But the other part of probably player centered that that I'm really big on is I'm a huge rest and recovery guy. And uh, so we, we do a lot of like, well, like wellness checks with Google form that are anonymous with our kids, just send it out on a Monday. Hey guys, like, how do you feel? How sore are you? And so we look over that data before we go into Tuesday's practice and it helps us build like how physical Tuesday is going to be, or, you know, we could send it out on a Wednesday and it helps us build it for that, that weekend and those type of things. And I'm, and like I said, when I, when we sit down and make the January through December schedule, like I make sure that we have more days off than we have practice. That is a hundred percent my goal. If you take those total 365 days, like we had better be more days off than we are on doing something. And so that's part of it is our kids know that I want them to rest and recover. And so one of the things that we adjusted that a lot of people don't do is we don't bring our varsity kids in at all on Saturdays. 
we don't see them for a couple of different reasons. Brad kind of mentioned like, how do I handle that personal goal? This is one of them, like not bringing our kids in on Saturdays allows those guys to go to campuses. It allows them to go to games without the concern of missing this or missing that. The second thing it does is it forces them to not be able to get out of bed. Like guys sleep until noon, sleep until one. And high school football is a physical game. So a lot of those kids are going to get out, you know, say the game's over at 10, 1030, if you're like us, and we throw it all over the place and they're going to go, they're probably going to go out to eat with their buddies or they're going to go home and eat. They're not going to get to bed till midnight, probably not really fall asleep until 1231. And then you're going to ask them to come back in the building at eight. There's zero chance their body's got more than five and a half to six hours of sleep. Us not bringing them in on Saturdays, they, they can sleep until 10, they can sleep until 11. I don't even ask them to come to the JV game if they don't want. They're guaranteed at that point in time that they'll give their body the, the rest and the recovery they need. And then we'll, we'll adjust our schedule on Monday to be able to watch some of that film that we need to watch and, and get the things done that we need to get done. But those are probably some of the biggest pillars of us when we talk to Player Center and building a program around what they feel like is important to them and what they want to get accomplished. Seems like the kids feel invested in everything, every aspect of the program, which I think is awesome. One thing we try to do is this Zoom stuff that's going on. I don't take attendance. They take attendance. I don't, they send me a text as far as attendance and just holding them accountable for their own. If we don't have enough guys in that Zoom meeting, they're calling their teammates and asking them to get on the Zoom. That's not my responsibility because we won't, I won't be on the field with you. You'll be on the field with these guys. <laughs> You need to make sure that they're doing their thing. So I really appreciate this. Some really good nuggets as far as that. And I'm really into the player center. As Coach Stout already said, that's my jam as far as giving them the power to have a voice. And I think that's very important because it's a long season, man. Yeah. We, so that lesson was hard learned. I know Brad learned it probably uh, way before any of us did because he was super successful back when I was probably still playing high school football. It's not to that's date the bird, That's the bird legend right there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But uh, like the first, the first time we made the playoffs at Bloom, we were an okay team. You know what I'm saying? Like we were heading up to Shelby to get absolutely smacked by the Armstrong kid and that team that they had that year. But I, I remember looking at a kid during practice on that Tuesday, it was our starting running back. And I said, Hey man, are you excited for the playoffs? And he looked at me dead in the eye and said, coach, I'm just ready to go fishing. Mm. <laughs> So that, that completely changed a lot of me to think, man, this kid's going to carry the ball 25 times Friday, and all he cares about is getting the heck off this uniform, and he wants to go fishing. So that really changed my perspective on – it's such a long – especially if you want to get to where Hannah's been and where Hartley's been and where I was lucky to be at Bloom. Like, that's a long season to ask those kids to be there five days a week, completely locked in. So we really try to find a way to build in some mental rest recoveries or just go have a fun day. I've taken our kids – literally completely out of practice and went and played basketball or went and played dodgeball in the middle of a, a rivalry week just because it's like, hey, we got to get away from this. We got to get away from the football side of things. Let's go decompress and have a good time. Still you know, wait, a lot of people don't understand that. You'll see, I, I joke about some programs that their season goes from February to May. They're excited about this and they're posting that and they're they're doing the hype videos in March and all that kind of stuff. And they don't, they have no clue what it takes to be playing in November. Zero clue. Cause every one of those kids is tired. Every one of those kids is sore. I had a great story and I don't know, 2015, I think we're in the state semifinals. And if you've been to Hartley, our locker room, you kind of got to walk through the parking lot to get to the field. And I'm the last one out, the head coach, last one out for practice, make sure everybody's out and linebacker who just played every snap as hard as he could, gave up every drop of blood for Bishop Hartley High School. He's in front of me, doesn't know I'm behind him. He's like, man, I do not want to be out here practicing. <laughs> and yet, these guys with the hype videos, they think, oh, it's going to be this and that. Listen, that kid played his ass off and gave us everything, but it's hard physically and mentally on those kids in November. And that's where you see a lot of the same teams that they're losing in the second round year after year because that's their stopping point. All the hype ran out at that point. And what separates the teams that you see every single year deep is they've they've created the, their bank that spread out through November. Huge key. Yes. It's a really interesting point. And uh, we have uh, not had the, as much of the continued success as I think as Bishop Hartley has, but it's something we're in right now, Mo. We've talked yeah. about it. We went to two weeks, two years ago, we went to week 15. Last year, we went to week 13. And uh, we pride ourselves on getting after it and getting pretty physical. <laughs> we're able to. 
And uh, we've had to have some conversations with each other. Like, hey, let's remember where we've been in the season and how long it is and where we want kids to be. And so I think we're very much in a process of understanding the high school athlete and what a week 15 looks like, what, a, what that is and, and how maybe as coaches, our May and June might have to look different to think about protecting those players and their bank, as you say, coach, and where we want them to be. And that's something we're still talking about. Still catching on, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, Wade's really good with this. I know it's a mindset. It is not, again, I don't, I've not seen his guys. He had the big combine just like Hartling Hannah had last week. I didn't see the three of us do a hype video for it. Yeah. And that kid who wanted to make sure he got in front of that hype video, it's going to be harder when he plays somebody in November when it's cold and they're pushing back on him just as much. Because, and, and nothing against the kid, it's our job as adults to school the kids up on priorities and mindset, but you've got to prepare them for when it gets really hard. And sometimes that's a lot of practice, sometimes that's less practice, but it's preparing for the long haul and easily talked about and every the people that have the most answers to this are the people that have, that have never had to do it <laughs> yeah i want to just jump in if you don't mind coach i actually when we coach mo you talked about learning those little nuggets of development from great coaches well i, I remember specifically the conversation brad had with me that completely opened my mind to a thought process and he says it a lot and he'll smile probably when i said it but he's like when you look at your team how many kids do you have that just love football like mm. how many of them just like us are just die hard everything's about football and it's less and less nowadays for sure with mm -hmm. all the other things that they can do so think about it like when you're super hyped to play week 14 or you're super ready to play in that regional final game there's probably only 10 percent of the kids on your team they're in that same exact mindset as you the right. other 80 are excited to be there but then there's the bottom 10 percent that just don't want to be there at all so that was a big piece that brad brought to me that kind of opened my eyes was how many kids on your team probably can you say love high school football? If you get a year like at Gahanna or us where you got 40 kids that love high school football, you're going pretty gosh darn good. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's that's not the case every that's single not, yeah, not they, they all love it on game night. It's can you get them on Tuesday from clowning around and, and those kind of things? Because they're all teenagers yeah. and we did the same. So those are the different levels of love. They all love it on game night and they're playing so hard and doing things that we don't do, right, as coaches. They're – putting their bodies and souls on the line and just really respect that. But it's, can you get them from Tuesday not to mess around? Can you get them on Wednesday to get away from the girls and try to just lock it in a little bit forward? And we all have those challenges. It doesn't matter where, when, sure. we all have those challenges. We've all probably been there before at a moment oh, yeah. in our team <laughs> where we've talked about we're going to have to drag this team to where <laughs> we know it can potentially go. I, I And Mo's laughing because we had this conversation. <laughs> Last yeah. year and other times where it, we, I think we've all had that moment where the team potentially had could do it, but it was a matter of dragging them through those sticking points. Maybe you could call it. And I coach think man, I got to tell you, I got to tell no. you, don't be too hard on yourself. Robert Mahaney, Gabe Helbert. We talked about underrated coaches, right? And, and Robert Mahaney's head coach at Shelby. Coach Mahaney, I'm waiting for your Buckeye ball page as well, buddy. Get back to me. <laughs> AU guy. He married Lee Owens, a daughter that, you know, Lee Owens, head coach at AU, who's, who's yep. stepped down now. And then uh, Gabe Helbert, man, head coach at Winford for many years, handed me, like, at one point I lost. It was my first time as a head coach. It was his 65th straight win. And the reporter goes, <laughs> What makes them so great, Coach? Is that something you envision for your program? And me at 23, I was like, no shit. I'd like to win 65 straight games. You know what I mean? Like, those are some great coaches over there. When we talked about the tight end underrated coaches. And I got a really good question that I want to ask. And I think this happens to us as coaches every year. As we talk about a player-centered program, what do you do to make everyone feel valued in your program or invested regardless of the role in the team? I think they're always – every year we all have a couple players who we really love. They're dear to our heart. They do everything. And just maybe athletically or whatever reason keeps them from being a starter. You know what I mean? So what do you do to pull them in, to invest them, to make them understand that, yes, their role still is very important. You love them and they're an integral part of the team. Me personally, this is probably where my player center 
really allows me to take it to another level. I absolutely love coaching those kids. And I challenge and I make my coaches coach every single kid. And we say that, right, especially as a head coach like Brad, you've been there. We tell our coaches, you have to coach every kid in the program. But we, you coach, you just mentioned those kids, right? Those ones that aren't necessarily the most athletic, probably never going to play a, a significant varsity snap. But we take pride in making sure those kids, when they get their rep, like our eyes are on them. We're grabbing them. We're coaching them. But that's my passion. I love doing it. Brad does a great job of this too. But like when our varsity kids are done and our JV kids are gone or our freshman kids are gone, like that might be the most coaching I get done. And I, I, all week long, like I am locked in on those kids. They know I'm running around. I'm talking to this kid. I'm hyping that kid up. I'm running to the end zone with that kid on the big play. Like I am super pumped during that time. And it's not fake. It's the truth because those are the backbone, in my opinion, of your program. Like you, you say those kids are never going to play, but you need those kids to be on the sidelines to create an atmosphere. You need those kids to be a, a scout team dummy or, or a guy to stand to, to be a body, to be blocked, to get something accomplished. So if you don't have those kids being invested, you're not getting anything. And then I think the second thing that we do is I'm not a big guy on running the score up at all, like at all. And so like the moment we can get some of those kids in the game, like we pull the trigger and we get them in the game. And even if it's just one kid here, one kid there, we get a kid off, we get a kid off. But like we're, if we're at 14 in the fourth quarter, we're putting some kids out there that probably most of, most teams aren't putting out there. They're putting all the same time in as everybody else. So we do a great opportunity to try to get those kids out so that they feel valued and they feel they deserve their opportunity, to be honest with you. But I, me personally, like that's when I, I really grow, grow as a coach. Like I love coaching those kids all the time. If you're the most unathletic kid in our team, me and you have probably had a heck of a lot of conversations because I am constantly talking to you. I'm constantly coaching you. I've always said to me, I think that's the hardest part of coaching when you just love, like we've been there before where you have a senior, right? And you love him. He's a program kid. He does everything. You try to get him in those situations. That's the hardest part for me to this day. I think it's above dealing with other situations, but when you truly love a kid and yet maybe there's somebody who's just a little bit more athletically better or knows the assignments or whatever it is right mm -hmm. so that, that makes them play above them and i think i wish more people would understand that us as coaches we want to win but we care about everybody being in our program right and that's not an easy choice right and it's not something that sits easy for us a lot of times and you know i could go back and i could probably almost every year name yeah. a couple kids where it's weighed yeah. heavy on me i love that kid to death i wish he would have had a larger role and I know you wanted a larger role, but wasn't there. So I was just curious to see about that. Yeah, I think you also got to find a spot for him too. And sit in situations, whether it's a you know backup right. kickoff role that you can, once again, you can throw him out there. You want to kick off or a kickoff return role, a PAT, you know what I'm saying? Give them something that they know that they can hang their hat on and get an opportunity. But I really think it's the relationships. Coach Mo talked about being a relationship guy. Like, that's my job. I know Brad does a great job with it. Like, that's who I am as a head coach. Like I, I get to know every single one of our kids as best I can, no matter who they are, whether the star or not. And they feel comfortable coming and talking to me. But that's how I think you get those kids invested. You invest in them. They might not be superstar football players, but they got a, They got hobbies. They got passions. They want to go do something in life. What can I do to help you achieve that? And I, I think that's one of the biggest things that, that we do. All right, a guest of honor. I'm going to get one more out of you. We'll, we'll start with you, Brad, in that classic man cave of yours, right? What do you got? One last question for Coach. Oh, I want to I want to piggyback a little bit on what you say first. Like It is painful, Kyle, and I can tell you say that, when a kid that you love to death and they're just not good enough. And, oh, it's just painful. And you think about that more than you think about anything else. And you can never truly say the right thing or do the right thing. And you're always battling. You just have to do the best you can. I know that's what Wade does in the same boat. But I wanted to piggyback on that because only the real ones understand what you're talking about, Coach Stout. Only yeah. the real ones understand how important that is and how much we all put into the, to every single child. Easy to put into the best ones. Wade, I'm going to end it with, I'm going to ask my last question with you. If you could go back and tell your younger self, because you're ultra successful, doing great. If you were to look at that first year, it, it was not the same year as you just had right now. What, do, what would you have gone back and told yourself at that time or given yourself some perspective? Whew. 
A lot. <laughs> Let's limit it to three. You got. You can only. You I went back in time. You could tell young Wade Bartholomew, the Huntington Huntsman, <laughs> with fifteen guys on the roster. You're gonna give them three things. To keep perspective. What are those three? That, and this is not a, a knock. Please, nobody. If you do this, but hiring guys who are alumni is not always what it means out makes out to be. Yes, they have a passion. They went there. But there's also some built-in habits that you're trying to break that sometimes those guys bring to the table that you're you know, trying to change. That actually happened to me at both places, at Huntington, Gallia, and Bloom. I just They were great guys. They seemed super passionate about the program, but they just they still had a, a mindset that you were just trying to adjust in your way. Number two, I know this is going to sound super cliche, but 100%, my wife is standing right here. She would tell you I completely changed after one of my seasons at Bloom, but winning is not the goal. Winning is not the end game. It's really not. It's not. And if you can truly get your thought process into that mind that winning really is low on the totem pole and developing the kid, being a good role model for them, getting them to achieve their personal goals. And you set winning as that bottom four or five behind a lot of things. And that's not what your focus truly is. Like when you have a problem in your program, if your focus isn't trying to fix it to win games on Friday night and it's focused on how can I do better for these kids, it'll make a huge difference on the things that you do. And then the way you behave and the way you react and the way that you handle conflict and the way that you handle starters and those different things. And we talk to our kids a lot about like kids that play are the kids that are going to buy into our culture. And, and you heard our three culture values. Not one of them has anything to do with wins and losses. And so if you have a super talented kid that's not doing it, and that mediocre, talented kid that is, like we play that mediocre, talented kid knowing that it might mean a loss or two. But one, it's going to teach that super talented kid a life lesson that some things are more important than just being talented and, and getting by. But it's also going to teach that mediocre kid and every other mediocre kid in your program that there's hope, right? That if you're just willing to go do these things, like you've got a chance and talent, talent's going to take a back seat. Probably third is what I talked a little bit about, like you don't need to be as busy as you are. Just because there's nothing doesn't mean you got to fill the nothing. And I'm actually trying to mentor a young man that played for me that just got a head coaching job in kind of that manner. He sent me his calendar from March to July. And the first thing I texted him was, dude, you do way too much. Like mm -hmm. you have to, we just, you, Brad, you talked about, like you don't understand it until you understand it. So that, that's probably one of the biggest pieces is it doesn't have to be a four day a week thing. It doesn't have to be a Monday through Saturday thing with a Sunday meeting. Like it doesn't have to be that to still have the opportunity to be successful. And I promise you, there's probably a lot of coaches out there that would take our January through December calendar and take a look at it and be like, this team won 11 games last year? Are you kidding me? Like they, they practice for an hour and a half every day. They don't even practice every single day of the year. So less, less is more would definitely be something I would definitely tell myself. I want to pause there because that's, that's a awesome. great coach. And, and is. coach is stealing thunder, but it's funny because on our episode list, our backup episode idea is three things you would tell your younger self. And so it's always <laughs> been the it's been the backup idea that if we ever ran into a situation where something happened, right? Guests can't make it, something happened. It's been the go-to what we're going to do and what our episode is going to be. Let's stop there. You gave us three. Let's all go through yeah. one and we'll go in, in, from all of us here. And I'll start and then I'll give maybe Brad and, and Mo a chance to think about it for just a second. But of the three things or things I would tell my younger self for anybody that's listening is, is number one, don't let others talk you out of what you believe in a little bit. I can sit here and say that when I became a head coach at Westerville, I came with an, an early idea of how I wanted our offensive identity to be and what I do. And I let other people give their insight or their opinions into that. And flash forward, the things I'm doing now are the things – I somewhat <laughs> talked about then, right? Being a little bit more multiple, doing some things with some different sets and packages and things. And uh, you got to stay true to yourself. At the end of the day, it's and you're going to have to uh, take the wins or take the losses. And so if I were going to go back to my younger self, I'm not saying don't include people in conversation. <laughs> but what I'm saying is at the end of the day, go with your gut, what you believe in, be true to yourself and listen to yourself. That would be one of my one things. I'll go. Obviously, with, with that being said, the one thing that I would say to my younger self is that is what you said is that winning isn't everything. Winning isn't everything. And my job here is not to win ball games. My job is to make sure these young men and women have a great experience playing football. 
And however that falls, starter, non-starter, however that may be, but that's the big thing is just to make sure that these kids have a great time and they're better before than they were, or they're better now than they were when they came in. And that's the big thing for me. And I, I've gotten older and I've, this is probably this is my 20th year coaching. So I've got to that point where I'm okay with that. And there's a lot of kids, like you said, there's a lot of kids that really didn't play, but we still talk all the time. I get phone calls. We get text messages. They send me wedding invitations and things yeah. like that. So that's the essence of, of football. <clears throat> that's the essence of what we do. We're inspiring young men and young women to be successful in life more than football. Brad, you've got 60 years in this game, man. What yeah, you got? I think, I think I would go back and tell my younger self that it's going to be okay. I think we wasted a lot of time <laughs> and kept everybody on edge. And maybe we still do it at some point because you just worry about everything. And I think in the end, the kids are going to show up on Friday night and they're going to play really hard. We have lost a lot of sleep on Monday and Tuesday worrying about every single thing and none of it really mattered. And particularly in my younger self, you just, you just stress so much. You made everybody miserable. We hit a phase where you make more people miserable winning than you do. And so I think you'd rather enjoy some of those things and we do a better job of it now. We, you know, but I would tell myself to just relax. It's going to be okay. I love that. That's a good point. As a younger coach, I've definitely found myself caught up in some of that at times oh my gosh you worry about who's mad and are you gonna what if you lose are you gonna are you, i've been watching friday night lights am i gonna get fired for sale signs and all this kind of stuff and it's stupid it, it's high school football and the kids are going to give you everything it's got everything they got get back out of monday and do it all over again coach holiday the bell of the ball a couple episodes above coach war what you got for the final question maybe I don't know we covered everything for me. I just appreciate you coming in and, and, and talking. And there's a lot of nuggets that I've wrote down on some paper and things like that. And it's always good to get a different perspective um, from sure. a different coach, like we talked about as far as communication and things like that. So I, I don't know if I have a question, but I just appreciate you coming on. And I appreciate style allowing me to finally get back on here and, and talk football, man, because we love football. We love the game. And and we're going to continue to collaborate and, and things like that. I'll see Coach uh, sun, uh, Sunday. We'll get after a little bit, and then I'm excited. So I, I just want to thank you for coming on, and thanks, Stout, and thank Coach Birchfield for having us. And hopefully this is not my last time on this thing. So. <laughs> oh, for sure not. And I just want to, hey, I appreciate you guys. Once again, make sure you subscribe to the show on, on whatever platform you're listening. Give us a rating. As a coach, we're competitive about trying to make this as, as best as we can. We really care about the relationship side of things. Doing this podcast and doing this as this business has opened up the ability to talk to way more coaches. I don't know if Coach and I would have really talked if it had not been for this opportunity much. I think the relationship between Brad and I has changed even in the, the aspect of doing this. And that's been the hidden bonus of this. Make sure you reach out to Fundraising University. This is a great time to set up any of your uh, fundraising needs or story rivals for your team apparel stuff. I want to just thank each and every one of you for coming on here. I think this is a great episode that everybody could take something from. I'm super intrigued by the no Saturday thing. That's got me thinking a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. And so I, I just want to wish you guys all success. Let's continue to celebrate Central Ohio football. I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you.